you know, this is a noble, it's new. It's new, even though it's part SARS has been other iterations. Now we got Delta, we got, you know, Epsilon, some other right. variants. Right. What is it? What is this thing? What is right. this virus? Right. So literally coronavirus, you can think of us like the name Jones. We know there's many families named Jones, right? Um, and there's many coronaviruses, literally thousands, but there's only six of them that are known to have human to human transmission. And only two of them, unfortunately, that are known to be deadly to humans, that being MERS, which is the Middle Eastern um, Respiratory, and then SARS that we know now as, as COVID. Um, yeah, and it, it is one of those things where it's, viruses always evolve. That's why they've been able to stay around. They're smarter than, um, than us in that they figure out different ways to evade our immune system. Um, we're seeing the same thing here with, with the Delta um, variant and also with the, the UK variant, um, or UK, the South African variant was the same way. It can evade the immune system, meaning that it can kind of trick our antibodies by slightly changing its, its shape. Um, for lack of a better word. Um, yeah, and we, so, which means that we just have to keep up with it. And the way we keep up with it is, for one, the scientists who came up with the mRNA vaccine is not a new thing. Literally, mRNA vaccines have been in the works for decades. Um, and we're using mRNA vaccines for cancer, cancer treatments, which is a whole different arena. But the reason why it can be used is that we train your body to recognize a protein meaning that if you have a breast cancer, for instance, if there's a protein, a receptor on that breast cancer cell, if I can give you this, this vaccine to say, hey, recognize this breast cancer cell and not make your entire body sick where people are losing their hair from chemotherapy or losing their kidney function because the chemotherapy agent kills all of the cells, then that's the best approach. And so that's what mRNA vaccines have been used for, um, for melanomas, for instance, um, to try to help with that. Now that we have this as an agent to use for with viruses, we can hopefully be able to look at the genetic sequence now, this Delta variant, create a vaccine specific for it, and now be able to target it a little bit more efficaciously. Um, but the problem is, is that the longer we go with people not being vaccinated and the COVID, vac or COVID virus passes from one person to the next person to the next person, the more likely it is to mutate itself and become smarter. So we're gonna to have to just make more and more different vaccines instead of and just- people, oh, And people right. don't even wanna take the first one. So they definitely, right. what, another one? Oh right. my goodness. So so Rona, I said, Rona gonna be here for a while. I think she ain't never going. <gasps> uh, we probably won't be here, but Rona and the roaches gonna be here. Uh, Dr. Dr. Ebony Hilton is here. Um, why'd you become a doctor? And why <laughs> anesthesiology? Cause that's the most- <laughs> Uh, heavily insured. I mean, you, you can't make a mistake. Right. I mean, it really is one of those things. So um, when I was eight years old, my mom, my little sister asked my mom if she could have a brother and I'm the middle of three girls. And, um, and I came from a single parent home. And in that question, my mom started crying. And that was the first time I ever remember my mom crying at all. And um, she told us that my parents' first child was actually a little boy that um, they were in high school young poor kids and they went to a clinic and she had a test done on her she doesn't know what the test was but she felt a sharp pain and she started leaking fluid and she went home she's 17 she called the doctor and said hey i'm my underwear are wet is this okay and they said yes everything is fine she went into labor two days later and um, unfortunately my brother only lived for three days and he passed away and so at eight years old, my mom is telling us the, an abbreviated version of that story, but um, I made up in my mind right then that I wanted to do something so that moms wouldn't have to cry. And that literally was the only reason why I wanted to go into medicine. And so growing up in medicine, the thing that's frustrated me was that um, I realized that my child, as a, as a double board certified anesthesiologist, my child is three times more likely to die than a white woman with a third grade education. And, and the, there's systemic reasons as to why that's the case. Not to say there should be a two-tier system, but you would think if you if you climbed up the educational ladder and you've taught yourself what signs and symptoms to look out for, if you now have money that my parents didn't have to be able to go to a, a doctor's office for prenatal care, you, and you have all these resources and friends who are in every specialty, why is my child more likely to die than this white woman's, like I said, with a, a third grade education? Um, and that's what I've been trying to 
really tackle now, more so than even practicing clinical medicine, is addressing systemic racism and the necropolitics or policies that play into why Black people get the short end of the stick in every sector of um, society that leads to worse outcomes for us. It's not that we're vulnerable, we're, we're targeted. 8668018255 you know as you as you're talking about the disparate ways in which you know and and it's a shame healthcare should not you know i i went to the doctors this week mm-hmm. and i was for the first time in my life i'm questioning you know this doctor is he culturally responsive you know so i'm having a conversation with him that i've never really you know you you trust doctors right you you should right or th- that's the way we've been trained but i can't even trust that I'm going to get service. Cause I don't know if this person, and he may not even know how racist he is, mm-hmm. you know what I'm saying? Or whether he cares about my life or what, uh, whether I'm valuable enough to, to give his best. So I'm, I'm asking him like, listen, a keloid, you know, what's your procedure for, you know, the, the incision and how are you going to deal with the scar? And, you know, mm-hmm. Oh, I pressure. And I was like, okay, right answer. You know, like, but I'm going through this in a way that I haven't before. How should we talk to our doctors to find out right. if they have our best interests. How do we know? Right. I say for one, um, I tell my family, cause I don't come from a medical family that there is no such thing as a dumb question. If you have a question, ask it. And if they don't answer in a way that you can understand, ask it again. Um, I, I hesitate a lot to say, to put the um, onus on the shoulders of patients because I don't know how to offer or fix a car. When I take my car to a mechanic, I'm expecting them to do what's best, right? I don't, I don't know what questions to ask. So I put the responsibility on the physicians and on the medical system and say that we need to have some accountability tied to our outcomes. And that's one of the things where my, uh, I have a uh, consulting firm, Good Stock Consulting. We literally wrote a memo asking for a, um, a federal department of equity of where you can have different metrics that are traced, just like we, we say we need these for the police officers and have some, some trackings of what are good police officers, what are bad ones. Same thing needs to be for in the medical field. We need to have something where we can literally look at what are the outcomes for each physician, a report card, if you will, that is public facing so that you, can t- you won't have to, to worry. You can literally look at this person's report card and see, are the outcomes for their black patients versus their white patients, are they Mm. different? What is it? Do they have higher complication rates? Do they have longer hospital stays? Do they have um, worse survey outcomes as far as um, patient satisfaction scores? All that type of stuff should be made readily available to you when you're walking into a clinic to say, is this someone I want to turn my life over to? And then hold the hospitals responsible for who they are employing. If you're seeing you're getting bad outcomes from this person, why are you allowing them to still practice? I think I'm probably different than most people in the world when it comes to doctors that I don't just assume that they are gods. Mm -hmm. Um, And and that really came for me because I was hospitalized at 19 and um, told that I had to, you know, I had to sign three different pieces of paper and they said they'd only cut me if they had to remove my tubes. And I woke up in an OR and I'd been cut from hip to hip and nobody came to tell me what had been done to me for three days. Wow. Um, that, that's just the end of that story. It was a nightmare from then on. And I kind of said, I am never ever going to go to a hospital even when I die. I just wanna die in my bed. So um, I will say that for me, I'm always challenging my doctor. I mean, I lived with a, a diagnosis, a terminal diagnosis for six years with 13 endocrinologists refusing to accept me as a client because they said, you are ignoring our advice, which is you could die. You need to have this surgery right now. And for me, it was like, well, that surgery, the dangers you've told me of that surgery are, are things that could happen to me that I'll be wanting to die if that happens. So I'll risk just dying than having that surgery until I found a doctor who, you know, from the minute I sat down with him, he had something on his desk. It was like the, the, a 3D model of the inside of the throat. And it, it, my surgery was they had to operate in my throat. And I was like, well, what's that? He's like, oh, you know, some doctors, this is how I train doctors. Cause not every doctor can visualize the inside of the patient's body 
you know, before they cut so that they're prepared for things. I'm like, you can do that. Okay. You, you can, you. Do, you can do my surgery. You can do my surgery. Right. <laughs> but you know, it was six years of talking to people. And I was like, no, you can cut three places to figure out what you got to do. No, no. I'm right. just dying before I let you do anything. <laughs> right. Right. And the fact that he actually took the time to talk to you. Now, I think that's a, that's a big thing in medicine. Um, you know, I love my coworkers. I love my colleagues. I love my, my field, but we miss out of a, a lot of, um, socialization going through med school. I mean, you got to think our entire twenties are spent our entire from 18 to 22 was spent in college trying to get into med school from 22 to 26 was actually in med school. And then from 26 to 30, yeah, 30, 31 was um, residency training. My entire twenties was spent in a hospital where we were working upward eight, 80 hours a week. Um, and so you don't get a lot of people interaction and how do you deal and, and, and talk to people and how do you actually develop, um, I don't know, Interpersonal, basic, yeah, interpersonal basic, relationship basic, skills, yeah, right, and it me and it means a lot. It means a lot to sit there and and instead of you standing with your white coat on looking down on someone, just sit down and saying, "How are you? Like, who are you? You know, who is this in the room with you?" and and getting to know a person. Um, but medicine can be very fast paced and very, um, how do you say it, um, sterile. And we need to get away from that because that's why we end up getting these disparities. But I absolutely hate that you went through that when you were 19 because I cannot imagine the PTSD that comes with that. So, mm. yeah. I'm okay. I have four babies at home yeah. after that. But, you know, uh -oh. even a friend of mine, she had a diagnosis that um, the doctor kept saying, I kept saying to her, what's the prognosis for this thing they found? She's like, the doctor, the doctor said, I don't want to go there. And I said to her, that's not his job. his job. You need to, he needs to tell you what the, po what the possibilities are. Mm -hmm. And I finally was so sick of this doctor. I had to go off on my friend and risk our friendship. It turned out she had fourth stage lung cancer. Please. And, you know, I was able to get her to a different doctor whose the treatment is working for her. But for months, he was like, I don't want to go there. I don't want to go there. I don't want to tell you what the possible things could be. I want to go there. It's my body. It's my yeah, body. Somebody. Somebody. Right. Right. Do Dr. Ebony Hilton is here. I know you have to, to go. I just anesthesiology is is a is a mystery. That's where you put people to sleep, right? But it, it's it's more than that. And and I was alluding to the how precise you have to be right. because if people don't wake up, that is your whole practice. And so right. you own your business. Talk about the business and starting a business like like the one you have. Right. Uh, I tell people all the time, my, my only job is to keep them alive. Because if you can think, if someone can go in, and cut open your brain and, um, and take out your heart and you don't die, that means that someone was on the other side of the drape, literally keeping your blood flowing to every single organ and everything, every single cell. And that's what made me want to go into anesthesia when I finally, um, you know, I didn't know what doctors, I thought doctors were like Dr. Quinn medicine woman because I don't come from a medical family. So I thought doctors just did everything. So when I got into med school, it was like, oh, okay, I have to, I need to actually choose something. And um, and initially I was going to go into OB because again, my little brother, but when I was on my OB rotation, I absolutely loved it. But I thought to myself, I don't want, I want to be able to work with men, women, young, old, um, the full spectrum and anesthesia because of the way we, we literally, are kind of almost like the little ninjas. We're everywhere, but you never see us. We're, <laughs> um, I mean, we do things in psychiatry. We do things on OB, um, literally every surgery. And if, if they're in the hospital, if your heart stops or if you stop breathing, literally that overhead when you hear on Grey's Anatomy, when they say code red or there's a code and everyone takes off running, the people that take off running are the anesthesiologists because we have to place your breathing device um, or your breathing tube. We have to... Um, you know, conduct the code or, or run the CPR, like that's what we're trained to do. But um, so that's what I do in the hospital. My consulting firm, what we do is literally we we address health, uh, disparities and racial disparities and it's agnostic to industry. We really try to tackle it in every single sector of, um, of society. So 
we have clients that range from nonprofit organizations. Um, we, we, we work with, with churches, for instance, we work with um, um, different foundations on upwards to corporations like um, Pfizer, St. Jude, um, um, Virginia Department of Health, uh, South Carolina Hospital Association. And in doing so, what we're trying to do is say, we know that health, health does not happen in a hospital. Um, meaning that, you know, healthy people don't come in the hospital, sick people come into the hospital, which means that health must happen out into the community. And it's where you eat, work, sleep, uh, play and pray. So how do we then address the factors that lead Black people to be sicker um, because of environmental racism, like Flint, Michigan, where we're allowing for water to be toxic, right? Or if we're looking at um, urban centers where we have this air pollution, like in Atlanta, where asthma rates are out of control because you're choosing to put these industries in our community. Or we can talk about, um, you know, hospital deserts, um, food deserts, pharmacy deserts, where they're literally, you're, you're twice as likely to not have a, a hospital in your community if you're black or brown compared to if you're white. You're four times more likely to not have a grocery store in your community if you're black versus if you're white. And what does that do to the development of high blood pressure, high cholesterol, diabetes, obesity, if the only thing you put in my in my neighborhood is, is Hardee's, Taco Bell, Burger King, and McDonald's. Um, it's, a, it's a targeted thing that's done to our black and brown communities and making policymakers aware of it and saying these are the these are the statistics and the data that I'm getting out of the clinical sense of what I'm seeing in the hospital, and it's directly related to you. So how are we going to meet in the middle to fix this, so we can stop reporting the same disparities that our grandparents were facing for our grandchildren to come? So, and I want to jump in on one more thing that you know the hospitals. If you don't have money, the hospitals can charge you less, but they don't have to tell you that. And so a lot of us get caught up in paying these bills that the government would have paid those hospitals for. And then we get caught in a cycle of debt and we get sick again and then we can't, you know, so, you know, yeah, get the word out there. I also was concerned about this, the money that's going out for childcare. Who's letting the people who've never made enough money to file taxes know about, you know, that they are entitled to this money for these children they have? Because it's not automatically coming to them if they've never earned enough to file taxes. Right. Right. You all do that kind of work, right? And and we we don't historically, but should we? Yes. And I I really I honestly say that we have about thirteen um, subcontractors now that we we've, we've hired out because we want to broaden our reach to say in every sense of the word. And it's not only you know about alerting them that the money is there. It's also how do we set up programs within our black and brown communities to say let's do some not financial literacy because it's not like we're illiterate. It literally is just let us expose you to what you can do with these uh, with this money. Let us let us help um, you know to organize. Sorry, that's my okay. You gotta go. Um, I'm okay. Thank no. you. I'll be okay. the front door. If you call right. me, um, that's my All right. part. You got it's you gotta go. You gotta go. No, no, it's my business partner. He's actually okay. calling me to let me know that the case is done. But um, right. but no, but it, it is about you know how do we. How do we not allow the government to just say, here's some money and, and we gave you money, now be happy. No, the money was entitled to us anyway. We're not even gonna get into reparations and the things that weren't given to us. We're not gonna talk about the fact that this wealth gap is gonna take another 250, 260 years before we start to close it because of Homestead Act, the GI Bill and Social Security Act. We're not gonna get into that. This, this money that you're giving us you're not giving us money that wasn't already ours in the first place. And then you're spreading it out against, against everyone. And quite frankly, me and my state right now, um, I don't need that money. If I had kids, my mom needed that money for me and my sisters. Why right. are you giving that money to, to persons that don't necessarily need that assistance? But um, that's the whole difference in equality and equity, right? Come on. Yeah. So, so, um, so Dr. Dr. Mm -hmm. Ebony Hilton, um, good stock. You, how'd you come up with the name and how many good stocks are there? Are they just in Virginia? Yeah. So um, good stock is only, I have two partners. We, we started in um, 2018 in Charleston, South Carolina. And yeah, we, we licensed ourselves in. And um, the name came from actually my business partner, Kelly. Her grandmother used to always tell her and her sister that they come from good stock. 
and to remember who you are. And it's one of those things when we first got together, um, I was telling them, you know, I've, I've always had this kind of great sense of pride and confidence in who I was because when I was in the fourth grade in learning about DNA sequencing, it pieced together in my mind of like, oh, well, if I get my DNA from my mom and my dad and my, you know, and my mom got her DNA from my grandmother, then that means that a form of me must have always been living and thriving and breathing in, the, in my grandmother and trace that back. And so I started thinking to myself, well, that means then a form of my DNA was living and breathing and thriving back in Africa. And so with that transit, it took, you know, it took them three months for the Atlanta tra uh, transit. And we learned about that when I was in, the, like I said, third or fourth grade. And I was thinking to myself, like, well, if they were down in the bottom of the boat with no food, no water, no sunshine, and yet it didn't kill me, because if it killed me, I wouldn't be here today. So I was strong enough to survive that. And then once we we're in America, fast forward for another, you know, generation after generation after generation, we're treated like less than human beings, literally punishable by death if you learn how to read and write. And yes, we were the greatest philosophers and, and architects this world has ever seen. And then fast forward another, you know, 100 years after the Emancipation Proclamation, we were still told we we're three fifths of a human um, and that we can't ride this bus or, you know, go to this school. But yet when we open our mouths and walk the streets, we literally change the constitution of the greatest nation in this world. Like, that's who that's who we are. That's who, you know, I am. And it, and it made me tie into that whole idea of you come from good stock. It's like we want to make sure that every black person knows that's who you are. And there's nothing that things that should have killed us, you know, with this whole pandemic. If a black people, if you made it through this, um, you not only survived, but you thrived. And that's the greatness of who you are. And if we can pool our resources together to start saying, hey, we're no longer gonna allow for things that have been targeted towards us to continue to happen. We're gonna speak up. Um, we're gonna we're gonna demand that things change that our future children um, can stand on our, sh on our shoulders and literally sprint up the ladder. Cause that's what we're doing. I mean, I come from parents that my grandmother picked cotton, <laughs> literally. Um, you know, my, my parents didn't graduate from high school because that wasn't necessary. I mean, they were in the third grade when they integrated schools. School was not a safe space for them. Um, and yet my parents raised an account. My, my sister is the our CFO of our school district, my older sister. My younger sister is the principal of our elementary school. And, and I'm a doctor. And they did that with high school, with not even high school education. And our children, it's like, I want to see what, how you're going to shift this world. And every child has that potential. Yeah. I'm going to yes. just let that sit. Um, say more, <laughs> say less, say nothing else. Let that just sit in people's spirits. 